Everyone is coming in. Welcome, everyone. Welcome everyone to the PRSA Travel and Tourism section as we're hosting this webinar jointly with the Black Travel Alliance. Uh, we're gonna give it a few minutes to allow everyone to join in, but we're hoping to have a great conversation with you all today. And keep in mind towards the end of the webinar, we will uh, allow for questions for you to ask any of the pan panelists. Uh, and just keep in mind, this is a safe place to ask whatever questions you like. We're here to educate and learn and share what we know. And most importantly, we just want everybody to know steps that you can take today to be inclusive of Black people and the work that you do when it comes to the PR world. Um, so we're going to give it about uh, a minute or two before we go into a conversation. Uh, and we're going to let you guys uh, start logging in. So we have about um, 23 attendees at the moment, and we're waiting for several more. So just hold tight. Also, one more thing to mention towards uh, the end of the webinar, if anyone has any questions, um, we will, if you raise your hand using the flag, the, the flag, raise your hand option on your screen, um, our co-host Taryn of PRSA, um, she's waving her hand there, will make sure that your question gets answered. We're slowly coming in. Come on in, everybody. Pull up a seat. <laughs> and also, um, anyone that wants to share um, this webinar later uh, with any of your colleagues or people in the industry that you work with, um, this will be available that we will mail out later and we will share it on uh, PRSA website as well. So stay tuned um, for that information after this webinar that you'll be able to share. So while people are logging in, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just, you know, again, welcome everybody for joining us today on this very important conversation on, so, and, and keep in mind, this is a safe space. So we're gonna learn today, we're gonna share, and I hope everyone's gonna walk away with some information on how to be inclusive when it comes to uh, including black people and black voices in the work that you do every day in the PR world. Um, this, this webinar came about um, you know, I, I, I've uh, had a few conversations over the last few weeks uh, with uh, Tamiko Harvey, and through those conversations, uh, we, PRSA uh, Travel and Tourism, we're wanting to make sure that we do our part to continue the conversation and provide steps that, that everyone can do. And so we was like, it was a great idea for us to, to partner with the Black Travel Alliance to make this happen. So I'm really great that we were able to do that. And, and so that's the, the purpose of how this came about. Um, today on the webinar, uh, Tamiko Harvey, um, who's a part of the Black Travel Alliance. She's also a travel influencer. She's gonna help me uh, moderate the panel today as well. Um, we have uh, one writer that I've met several times in Chicago who I've asked to join, Ms. Ro Ms. Rosalind Common jates She's a travel writer. Um, Rosalind is someone who uh, I instantly uh, met in Chicago. And there's a thing when you are a Black PR person, I think, and you finally find a Black travel writer in a city that you go to. It's an experience that happens, and the connection is made, and so many stories come out of that. And so... 
Uh, I thank you, Rosalind, for joining in and giving your input today. Uh, we also have uh, Martinique Lewis. She is a diversity and travel consultant, president of Black Travel Alliance. Um, she's joined us today. We have Janelle Watson. She is the vice president and communication strategist development at Cincinnati USA Convention and Visitors Bureau. Uh, we have Cambria Jones. She is the tourism marketing manager at the City of South Lake, Texas. We have travel influencer Francesca Moray. And we also have um, Lauren Gay. She is a travel blogger, podcaster, and photographer. Did I miss anyone? I think you got everybody. <laughs> everybody. Okay. So we're looking pretty full. So let's 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 jump into the conversation here. So the, the, I'm going to start the conversation, and this is going to be towards um, the, the president of the Black Travel Alliance, uh, Martinique Lewis. Can you tell us? about the Black Travel Alliance. How did it come about? Tell us about the organization. Yes, thank you so much for having me, first of all. Um, thank you everybody for being here. Like I said, I think it is a real testament as to where this industry is going. Um, a lot of people want to make a change. So thank you all for being here. And we are excited to share our narratives with you and to speak about actionable items for next step. As he said, I am the president of the Black Travel Alliance. I'm also the creative lead for Nomadness Travel Tribe and a diversity and travel consultant. The Black Travel Alliance came about um, shortly after the unfortunate events of George Floyd, um, right when Blackout Tuesday happened, when we noticed tons of travel brands and tourism boards posting that black square. And it took us by surprise because these are the same people who we have either attempted to work with or that we work with that have not always given us as much of a fair chance or has shown us as much equality as our white counterparts. So we said, okay, we can talk about it or we can do something about it. So 18 of us came together and said, all right, let's move forward as one and let's create a space for ourselves where we don't have to fight to have a seat at the table because we're building our own, where we can give a resource to other black travel content creators um, in any industry that, well, not in any industry, but in, in any travel niche that they are in, a place to come and feel safe, a place to know where they're wanted, a place to come where they can sharpen their skills and be the best they can be be within the travel industry. So from that, the Black Travel Alliance was created. Um, like I said, 18 people, we do run off of our three pillars, um, which are alliance, amplification, and accountability. Alliance in terms of the Black travel community coming together, but as well as those uh, brands who say that they are allies and what that really means. Um, amplification in terms of our voices to make sure that in all spaces, whether it's travel and adventure, whether it's travel writing, uh, whether it's ageism and travel, that our voices are heard. And then also accountability. Are we holding the, the industry accountable, especially now when people are saying they are a certain way, who is actually saying, are you who you say you are? Who is actually following up and saying, you said that you were going to employ this many black writers. Did you do that for the 2020 year? You said that you were going to change your social media uh, strategy. Did you do that? You said that you were going to invite this many African Americans or black traveler, travel writers, no matter where they're from, uh, you know, to your locations, did you do that? Um, so we're really excited to be in the space. A lot of people found out about us when we did launch on the 16th officially. I'm here to let you guys know that we are here to stay. We are not taking our foot off the gas and we are looking forward to creating a more inclusive community. And like I said, thank you for having us. All right. All right. Thank, thank you for sharing that. Feel like that needs to clap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I want to shift to um, the, three, the topics that we'll be discussing today. And uh, I particularly tried to fit the conversation within three topics, which is number one, PR messaging. So that's going to consist of pitching and, and internal messages, which often we don't think about how much internal messages when you're communicating internally and the importance of that. Although, because if you're not communicating internally, uh, that could affect what you're doing externally when you're trying to promote your destination or attraction or whatever it is that you're promoting. Uh, then we're going to talk about digital messaging and marketing. That includes imagery and website content, social media and creatives and things like that. And then we're going to get to, you know, we need to think about redefining what PR goals are and what that looks like. Uh, and so I just want to just point that out there for everyone. So I'm going to take the screen back so that we can uh, see the speakers as they're speaking. And so, you know, our first, our first question up, and this is going to be for um, 
Uh, for Janelle, you know, how should internal messages be modified or changed to be inclusive of Black people? Thanks, Milton, for having me. I appreciate being here. I think one of the things you, you hit right off the top with um, the setup with internal messaging is just the smallest thing can really make a difference. And when I think about, you know, I've been in the travel industry just for a year now. I jumped from um, uh, public relations and another venue to here. And the first thing I saw was I said, wow, you know, when I was going to different conferences, I said, there aren't many people that actually look like me at the conferences, uh, you know, with the, even when I had meetings set up with some of the travel magazines, you know, going around just trying to talk to different people, there weren't a lot of people who were African American um, that were at those actual events. So being a VP, I start looking at it a little bit more differently and saying, hey, we really have to talk to our stakeholders. Totally different. Take all of the ways that maybe you used to do things, throw it out the window because it's not going to match up to our white counterparts and maybe how you look at them, especially when it comes to looking at metrics. So I always say right from the top, and we get a lot of support at um, CBB with our um, president and CEO, but it's who's on the board of directors. You know, do you have African Americans in that community, in that city, that's also part of the board of directors? Because when you have that and you start sending the messages, to, it trickles down to the staff, it trickles down to the sales, sales team, that hey, they really are serious about making a commitment to the African American community. They actually have someone on the board. Another thing I think is really important is as a way to maybe even get started and hold yourself um, accountable, um, as Martinique was saying, is you need to be able to religiously give a update, a report to those board of directors. If you meet monthly, if you meet quarterly, you need to say, hey, look, we're gonna have a diversity report and we're gonna tell them how many travel writers of African-American descent or African that we brought in this month or that we know we're gonna bring in during our peak season over the summer. If you start building that into those reports, it shouldn't go away. And people should always still be asking the question, of course, can we do more? Is there anything else that we can do? Um, and I just feel like when you're telling the board that you're reaching out to, you're going to automatically want to reach out to those black travel writers. Um, you mentioned the, um, the woman um, who you showed in the previous slide as far as getting that story with Black Enterprise but having those black owned attractions because they are in every city you go to, there's someone who's doing something that's contributing you know, to travel and tourism that has a restaurant that everybody's talking about that they want to go to, but it kind of includes that as well into your um, diversity reports. And then another way I think that you could really be um, inclusive is your own staff, especially the communication staff. You know, do you have African-Americans on the communication staff? You know, if you have a big festival that's coming up and you know you're going to be pitching that or you're going to be bringing travel writers in, if you don't have anybody on the staff that's in the communications department, do you have someone that's a part of the sales team that could kind of offer their opinion? Maybe you can bounce some ideas off of there. I know budgets are tight and people aren't necessarily hiring, you know, people right now, but there are other ways to just tap into the Black community because when you do that, it really is going to benefit your organization. You know, it's always easy to go with a friend, you know, who, who may have given a good reference. You know, that familiar face is easy for all of us, but as soon as you bring diverse voices to your staff, it's only going to make your organization better. I agree. Those black voices are going to bring such a different perspective, and they can even give you the hookup to something you didn't even know was going on in the community. But if you tap into that, you'll say, wow, we didn't realize this was happening. And then you can bring a travel writer in to experience that this black and tell that story in all these publications and things like that too. Yeah. So I'm gonna lead into our next question. So what stories should PR professionals be pitching? So uh, Rosalind, I would love to get Rosalind or Francesca, I would love to get your, your guys' opinions on that. Um, what stories should, we, should, they be, should we be telling? So um, that's a great question. I get a lot of pitches and you know, every destination has something that they're known for, Memphis, barbecue, blues. But the thing that um, gets my attention is when publicists make the point of pitching 
something that appeals specifically to people of color. Every city, no matter the population, has some sort of story that's going to appeal to either African American style. There are lots of um, boutiques, designers that live in cities. Those stories could be really, really interesting in terms of places to visit. There are always going to be restaurants, either chefs or black owned restaurants. And there's always going to be some sort of history. Um, I, I do a lot of um, African diaspora stories. And I was approaching a DMO for information about a specific culture. And I was actually really disappointed because they did not know about this historic African American culture. Fortunately, I did, and I had to reach out to my own contacts, but that was a situation that I felt that if I hadn't already had that information and knew that there, it was out there, that story would never have been told. And this was for USA Today. So I think it's really, really important if you don't know those stories to start searching for them and researching them and having them for Black writers when you are sending them pitches. So it seems like one of the takeaways from that, that as you say, is becoming educated with the area that you represent, the city of the attraction and what they live within and making sure that you know all the areas uh, of, 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 of potential um, stories that you could tell that you just may not be aware of. And that's what you get when you actually have to intentionally search for it because it doesn't happen automatically unless you intentionally search for, for things that you don't know. Um, you know, Francesca, what would you like to say? I think you are on mute. I'm gonna unmute. There you go. I realize that. Okay. Um, and I'll say, as an influencer, uh, my big thing is authenticity. So if you do present those opportunities to visit historical sites or to have African American influence in my storytelling, for it to be authentic and to not gloss over the history, a lot of times I get disappointed if you. I haven't been to very many plantations, but just when you go and you experience this, these historical sites it's as if black people didn't exist or the colonial narrative is pushed. And that's something that's truly a pet peeve of mine and that I would never relay to my audience. And it ends up being a waste of time for me to visit these places on a press trip. And I don't end up even talking about them because they don't accu accurately portray the history. So that's something that I really wish would change in the travel industry, having an inclusive view of what has happened in the past. And then also um, as an influencer, you can work with Black influencers outside of Black History Month. So I would also love for my inbox to be <laughs> full outside of the month of February and allow the opportunity to visit places and tell it through my lens. And it's not always going to be here. I'm Francesca in this city, my Black owned experience, everything Black, but even just to have the information on hand so I can know Black owned restaurants, shops, etc. So if I'm doing a roundup or something, I can just show those places love the same way that I would any other um, spot that you would put on my itinerary. Okay. And so that leads us to... You know, I want to jump in for a quick second on that as well, is that some of the times the itineraries went with the press trips, and we may get into that a little bit later. They well, that was the next question. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> they are very cookie cutter, and they don't go with everyone's audience. And so we have to be very careful of making press trip after press trip and the itinerary is the exact same. We all have something unique and valuable to bring. So why not hone into that instead of, while there may be your bread and butter things that every city has, that these are our you know four or five major attractions, there's so much more to every destination. And we, we, we can market to more than just one or two things. It, so I think that needs to be discussed as well. But go ahead, I'm sorry. No, 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 that, that was the question. You know, the question that was gonna ask when it comes to creating an itinerary for media guests, what should PR professionals be doing to be inclusive of black people? Anybody else wanna add on to that? Yeah, I will. Uh, as, a, as a travel writer, as a travel influencer, um, it's, we would like to collaborate with you, you know, versus something being pushed to us. And um, because a lot of times it, it's, it's, it's okay that you don't know what you don't know. 
um, but maybe I do know, you know, and maybe I can suggest and say, hey, um, for instance, I was in Lake Erie, Shores and Islands. I worked with them a few years ago. Um, there was this great trail about the Underground Railroad. I knew nothing about that history, you know, them being so close to the border with Canada. So it was great that they at least had the packet of information, even though it wasn't part of my itinerary, but leave a little bit of that freedom for us to tell that story the way that we would like. And then the other part of this is um, we have to be very mindful about implicit bias. And what I mean specifically is that I consider myself an adventure traveler, right? Because of how I look, it is automatically assumed a lot of times that there are things that won't interest me. So I've been invited to destinations where my counterparts I tend to had kayaking or looking for a waterfall or a zip line. It had all of these amazing adventurous things and it wasn't even presented to me as an option. Number one, how do you not even know what my brand is? Like, nope, it's in my name, Outdoorsy Diva. It's very clear what it is and what I like. But a lot of times if people are just trying to check a box and they see that, oh, she's of a certain color, she's of this, and they make an assumption. And so the biggest thing is just don't make an assumption. Let's have a conversation. Let's do something that's beneficial for both of us because there is an audience of black people who like adventure incorporated into their travel. And so it's important to not pigeonhole us and think that um, there's things we don't do because you don't know. Yeah, yeah. anyone else wanna add on? Go ahead, Janelle. I just, oh, sorry, Janelle. Um, you can go ahead. I can, I can speak after you. Okay. I just wanted to say, like, this is the perfect time to get familiar with things like the Black Travel Movement. Like, the Black Travel Movement has been around for 10 years, and the fact that people, in terms of PR, they don't know where to look when there are these communities online that are specifically there for you. It's something as simple as following them on social media to see the type of content they are putting out to then be able to go and create your own itineraries. One thing that everybody on this call should understand is that black travelers are 70% more likely to go to places where they see themselves reflected. Meaning if that Francesco or Lauren or Tamiko go somewhere, like Francesca and Tamiko both went to Tempe, Arizona last year. We never heard of Tempe, Arizona before they told us about Tempe, Arizona. And guess where everybody's going now? Tempe, Arizona. So it's one of those things to really understand the influence and the purchasing power that black influencers help influence when it comes to black travelers. With the, the rise of the black travel movement, they are always, we're always looking for new destinations and recommendations from people who look like us. So if you do put it in their itineraries to go, um, Tempe, they, there is a African-American woman who, um, who runs part of their university system. If they put her in the actual in the actual itinerary, then when I go, guess who I wanna go see when I go there? If they go there and they tell them to go eat at JJ's, guess where I wanna go? I wanna go eat at JJ's because it's people who look like me. It's a place that I can go when I travel to actually feel like I'm connecting with somebody. So I just want everybody to understand that. It's, it's you making the decision to immerse yourself into our travel space because it's here. Um, and really understanding how we purchase, really understanding how we travel. And a lot of it is word of mouth because you have to remember also, Google can't tell me stuff as a black traveler where I should go. Google doesn't have a whole Rolodex of all the different African-American tours that are throughout the US, let alone any African-American tour that's in Amsterdam, Colombia, uh, Belize and anywhere else. It's these people who are telling me those things. So understanding the power of the Black influencer, the power of the Black travel journalist, the power of the Black videographer and photographer, it's so powerful. It is exactly influencing all of our purchasing decisions. Yeah. I think Cambria had a question and then um, Janelle, not a question. Yeah. But sure, I just wanted to add from the DMO standpoint when we're making an itinerary, I do think it's also our responsibility as experts for our destination to make sure that we're we have a good pulse on the businesses and the activities that we're sending you on. You know, we monitor our media, so we know if there's been conversation on social media or even comments representing racist incidents or things like that, especially with me working in a predominantly white destination. Um, I think that's our responsibility too when we make your itinerary to make sure we're sending you places that you'll be comfortable and also welcomed. So just wanted to add that point. 
Yeah, and to add to that, um, she's right. You know, just doing the research, asking the writer, what are they really interested in, the specifics, and really drilling down. You know, like you say, can't be cookie cutter, just, oh, let's just pull this itinerary, cut and paste. You really want to find out what experience that they are looking for because it's just going to make your destination even more attractive to those other visitors that may be reading about, reading about your destination in the article. And for us, um, most recently, last summer, we had um, a writer from Vibe Magazine, Stacey Ann Ellis, um, come to Cincinnati for the Cincinnati Music Festival. And of course, the festival is really big. You know, it sells out usually every year. But the difference with her was that she actually came and included businesses. So she went to the festival, you know, I escorted her, her around and she covered, um, you know, a barbecue business, just queuing, but she talked about how he gives back to the community. Another part of the article, we set her up with a, um, a lighting store owner and it's an African-American man who owns a very unique lighting store with really high priced lamps that most people <laughs> probably would not be purchasing, but she included that in the article. Then she talked to, um, we introduced her to um, a Cincinnati influencer um, that talks about Cincinnati from her perspective. And, you know, she says, hey, I'm, I'm curvy, you know, so she talks about African American women exercising and being curvy and being okay, you know, with that body. And so just setting that up, you do have to know people in the community and you have to be tapped into that. So just trying to find ways to, like she said, not just not only following, but really getting out to those events and getting to know people because they'll, they'll tell you, hey, if somebody's coming, bring them on by that we'd love to have them. Right. And, and, and I think it has to be intentional because it takes work to be intentional. Mm -hmm. And it takes that extra brain power to sit down and be intentional about uh, finding Black content creators, putting itinerary together versus just putting something together. And, uh, you know, that, that takes a little bit more effort, a little bit more time out of your day, but it's what's needed. We have to be intentional about working with content creators of color. And so, you know, and I'm, I'm going to add on to that before we move on to the next question. Uh, but, you know, I think one thing when it comes to the stories that you're telling, when it comes to the itineraries, if you don't know and you find that you are unaware and not knowledgeable of what you should be doing, there are tons of um, PR professionals that, uh, and, and, and that are Black that could help you in that space and help you craft those stories and create those stories. There are resources out there. And, you know, any of the, I'm pretty sure any of the travel writers, influencers on this panel could help you do those things and probably tell you things about your destination or, your, or, or, or the, the compartment that you work within within travel and, and that can help you reach the black audience so it is understanding that hey i don't not, i do not know something um but taking that intentional step and finding out someone that can help you connect the dots because you may not have the power to control who's on your team or who you hire but you do have access and to, to solicit resources that do exist to help you reach your goal so i'm gonna bring up just one little article here uh as an example of you know that storytelling piece uh, you know, and I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm using myself as an example because it's easier for me to just grab something quickly that I've done. But um, this is one story that, you know, oftentimes I'm always looking for unique stories to tell or, or a way to get the message out to be inclusive of the Black community in Memphis. And so here's one article that came out around Juneteenth time in June. Um, and, you know, it featured two uh, Memphis um, eateries, uh, and I just pulled up one here with Philip Ashley. It doesn't, and, and when it comes to thinking about how to include Black people, and, and for me, when I pitch, it is not always focused on that call to action to travel, but there's someone who's going to travel to Memphis who's going to remember this Black-owned shop, Philip Ashley Chocolates, and they're going to want to go there. So it doesn't say, hey, come to Memphis, but the fact that they were mentioned and included uh, has value. And, and, and so you want to make sure that those are some of the ways you can do that. Another article that, you know, that absolutely had nothing to do, to do with travel that I worked on recently was Cynthia Daniels and I uh, pitched for her to get mentioned in Black Enterprise. Uh, and the main reason was Cynthia Daniels did something amazing that basically she, on Juneteenth, she basically created a website where over 100 Black-owned businesses were all listed in one place that allowed you to shop. You could never shop at that many places in one day. So kudos to Cynthia uh, for creating that site. Um, but I felt it was important for me. I had, hey, Cynthia. I said, Cynthia, I reached out to her. I said, have you, who, who's been telling this story for you? Who, tell me, how can I help you? I said, 
we need to support you. Memphis Tourism wants to support you. So let me know how I can support you and get the word out because you're including about 30 restaurants in Memphis in your lineup. And, and the fact that those restaurants are all places that tourists can experience mean that's something that I should be uh, supporting and promoting. Uh, so I just want to throw that, that tip it out there. Um, so we're going to move on to the next question. Uh, and the next section is going to be on the digital messaging and uh, the marketing component. So, you know, when it comes to images, social media, website information, uh, what should PR practitioners be doing um, to in be inclusive of Black people? And I'm going to point this one to Cambria. Sure. And with me being in a small destination, I wear the hat of marketing, PR, communications, all of it. So um, to speak to that, I think the first step is to do a really honest audit of all of your marketing materials. Of course, I'm a black woman. So when I come into a destination, regardless of it being predominantly white or not, I'm gonna notice when there are no black faces anywhere to be found on the marketing materials, our social media and things like that. So first do an honest audit and ask yourself, you know, if I was of a different race, ethnicity, do I see diverse faces in this destination? How does that make people feel? And then from there, go ahead and fix the problem, but do it in an authentic way. I think Francesca mentioned earlier about checking a box and being authentic. That is so true. We can tell when people just kind of insert a black face and that kind of comes across, not kind of, it does come across as tokenism and we don't want that. You know, regardless of what our residential demographics are, that doesn't mean that that's the only people that come to visit. So I noticed, for example, um, when I came to this destination, we had mostly white faces at all of our events. But I look and I know that 80% of the people that attend are visitors, so not necessarily just the residential population. So I got a new photographer and gave them the direction to look for those authentic experiences that are happening with our diverse visitors. And then now those are incorporated in our marketing materials. So I think step one is an honest audit and then make a change. And it does help to have um, diverse faces um, on the team. I think Janelle spoke to that earlier. It makes such a difference because there's some things that we just see that others don't. Right. Yeah. Anyone else want to add to that? Um, I'll say hire black creators, hire black uh, content creators. A lot of us have photography skills as well. So you could even include that in a package. I mean, you have to be willing to use the budget as well um, because a lot of content, black content creators are taken advantage of and not adequately paid. So I think the budget is something that you have to reconsider moving forward, but also think about if you want more imagery, just asking the content creators you do hire already to include a few additional photos or video clips that you could use and repost on your socials. I feel like that could be an easy way to kind of solve that issue. I echo exactly what uh, Francesca said. Uh, it, it's a shame for us to take all of this amazing, beautiful imagery we share in our content, we share on our pages, but then the brands and the destinations, they don't use it. Mm -hmm. um, what a waste. And you have it right there for you, um, for your use. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna hire us, if you're gonna work with us, you're gonna have us on these trips, why not use the imagery that you have? And then also when you go to like a conference, um, you know, like a TBEX or WITS or what have you, and you have these opportunities to meet with the different um, DMOs face to face, and you have these beautiful displays and posters and everything is set up. If I'm looking through your brochure and I'm looking at your signage and everything around you, and there's not a single brown face on that, what does that say to me as somebody that, you know, is thinking about working with you? and you're thinking about working with me, it makes me feel like there is no intention uh, behind you bringing visitors that look like me. And so since my core audience is black, then that's important to me. Also, in terms of imagery is so, so important. Um, everybody is really, really on point with that. If I don't see somebody that's reflecting myself, that does affect my um, opinion of the destination and, and if I feel welcome but also pay attention to wording. Some marketing materials have wording and phrases that is not inclusive. Please be aware of that. That can be very off-putting. Make sure that you are using phrases that encompass everybody that cannot be um, looked at as insulting. Um, and you're going to have to have someone who is of color to tell you that. 
that's another reason why you should definitely work with people who are um, diverse. And then, go ahead, Tamika. I was just going to call on you because I want you to bring up the question that you asked me earlier. Yeah, you know, uh, we were talking earlier and I was saying, you know, it's a taboo subject, but destinations and brands, they don't want uh, Black people on their Instagram feed because it taints their Instagram feed. And that is a, that's, that's a real topic. They don't want to put off potential visitors by having Black people on their Instagram feed. And so how do you want our dollars uh, behind the scenes, but you don't want the mass majority of people to know that you are marketing to black people. That's something that needs to be discussed and, and not from a place of this is what has happened in the past, but how do we move forward? Because it's a real thing of not wanting black people on their Instagram feeds. They want it to be crystal clear and, and white families with the picket fence and the white dresses and shoes on running down the beach how do we change that narrative yeah you know and it, i'm just gonna I just go, go. say one thing because it's it's something that i've seen where you know we were talking about the multiple images that are available but you will find destinations that will use the same image of the same you know smiling black woman or the same family looking out at the you know ocean you know there are so many different you know, looks to us. And it doesn't have to be just this one image or you just see that one image over and over and over again in the destinations, marketing materials on their websites. Use it all because it's out there and there's so many beautiful spectrums and things to, you know, include. And it's just beautiful to have everything in there. So that was just one thing I wanted to point out too that I know that sometimes you find a good image and that's all you use. Use it all. There are plenty out there. And I want add to that um, because only not only when you use your images but when you use the images of black people do it with the intent to smash the negative stereotypes that are that are stigmated around black people I, I, I keep talking about Tempeh I see Miss Tony is on here I will never forget looking at their brochure and they had a black family by the pool yeah. now why is this so important first one because y'all, not y'all, but people think that black people do not swim. I don't know where the stigma of that comes from, but black people swim. They like to get in the pool. They get hot like everybody else. They know how to backpedal. They know how to do all of that like everybody else. That was the first negative stereotype that that picture smashed. The second one was a black family. Nobody shows the black family together anymore. Everybody just thinks that the father is not around, that it's a single mother. So not only did it show black people swimming, it showed a full black family so now black families know our arms are open to you and if you can create these images that smash these narrow negative stereotypes that are around black people i'm telling you black people will come even more so you have the opportunity to now embed it in your brand's dna when this all happened and my company skyroom was turning in our things to the black travel alliance for the pull-up campaign I asked my marketing manager, because I'm over the social media influencers, I said, how many black people um, will be on our social media every year? And she said, what do you mean? I said, give me a percentage. I said, because then me as the social media director knows that we have to work with this many black people in order to meet this quota. So if you say 40% of our feed needs to be of black people using the Skyrim, then I know when I'm getting influencer pitches that, okay, I need to make sure I meet this quota. So embedded into your brand's DNA that we want to show this much inclusivity, not only on our website, on our social media, and in our marketing materials, make it a number, 30%. So that your social media people also know if this black person or if this black family came and they tagged us, we should be repurposing this picture because we have to do this this amount of times. And then you won't have the problem, but you have to make the decision that it's important enough to you to make sure that your online is inclusive of black travelers or of everybody. You have to make the decision as a brand that we are moving forward doing this. You have to make the decision that you are willing to lose visitors coming because they might not like that you are showing black people, but you are making that stand and saying, we welcome black travelers here. And I had to tell the same thing to Skyrim when we released a Black Lives Matter statement. I said, are you guys willing to lose customers? And, and they were. And I said, okay, thank you. Because now you're supporting me, not only as your black employee, but as a black customer of your product. So. Right. 
Yeah. And, so and, on that note, I'm going to tell you know my fellow PR colleagues on this webinar right now. After, not right now, but after the webinar, go check your um, your your photo database. Uh, whether you use Clean Pics or Barber Stock, whatever you use, see what that looks like. Go take a look at that. Um, go look at your Instagram. What do you see? How far do you have to scroll before you see a black face? You know, those are some immediate things that you can go do to check the pulse of your organization and see what you're doing. So I checked the pulse of my own organization today when it comes to our uh, Instagram. And so um, I was fairly pleased, I have to say. Um, you know, I, I did two scrolls and these are the pictures that I got in, the, in those two scrolls. And, uh, and uh, you know, it's just, this is, I feel, is a real rounded, uh, diverse photo and accurate representation uh, of Memphis. So, you know, it's just, it's, it's one, and I did, I promise you, I didn't, I did not stage this. I didn't put, I didn't make the digital team post anything for this today. Um, but I just literally, right before this uh, webinar, I said, hey, I just want to do a, a self test myself. Uh, and see how Memphis is performing uh, and, and make sure that I, I, I do what I preach. Uh, and so, let's see, we have time. I, I wanted here. to add one more thing though to what uh, Marty said, which is when you make this decision to be intentional about this, you have to understand that um, this is a human issue. It's not political. Being inclusive, being diverse, it's not political. We get pushed back a lot of times from the DMOs and the brands that say they don't want to be political. It's not about politics. I'm this, I'm this brown all the time, 365 days a year. Um, it doesn't matter if I'm left, right, red, blue. It's not political. Um, the way we're treated is not political. It's human. So if it's important to you to represent humanity in your destination, then you have to be diverse and inclusive and okay that some people won't like that. And, and, and on that note, you know, I'm going to add to that, and I'm just going to say, you know, when it goes to everything that's happening in our country regarding Black people and happening throughout the world regarding Black people, it's, it's, it, it is not a, a political stance. It is the, the livelihood of Black people who want to be able to travel without having any issues or worries because of the color of their skin, without having to travel and walk into a place and, and, and feel that we're welcomed. Um, so it is definitely uh, not a political uh, conversation, but more of a, a civil right that all Black people have to feel included and be included uh, in this industry. Um, so I'm going to go to our uh, next question. We have about five minutes to talk about this particular question because I think this question um, really sets the, the crowning of, uh, of, of, of the goals for the organization. So how do we, we're going to have to redefine success. So the question is, often PR professionals tend to prioritize media outlets based upon who has the biggest audience reach. So, you know, why is this problematic and, uh, and, and how should we go about making sure that we're reaching out to a black audience and black professionals? Um, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna task that with Rosalind. Uh, you know, any, any thoughts regarding that? Yes, um, well, the reality is if you are going to go after um, the major publications you are not going to get a black voice. If you are interested in being inclusive, then you're gonna to have to specifically go after black voices to get the diversity that you need to tell your story. Um, black writers are everywhere. We are out there, but we are not that always that visible. Um, and you are going to have to do the work to target us so that we can tell your stories. Um, and, you know, being a Black writer doesn't mean that we only tell Black stories. We can tell your story in a way that it is going to inspire everybody, including people of color. Me telling your story means that people of color can say, oh, she really liked it. She didn't have a problem. So this must be a really cool place. So you get a, you know, an increased impact that way. But it's, you know, it's going to take effort. Yeah. Right. Uh, no, go ahead. Marty, go ahead. <laughs> well, I, I was like itching to say this. I feel like as an influencer, um, follower count has been become a glass ceiling for Black content creators. It's something that brands use all the time to justify why they don't work with us because 
we don't have as many numbers, but as the last few weeks have shown, it's not because of our content and it's not because we're not good storytellers or anything like that. It's really just a matter of circumstances and not being amplified because a lot of us grew exponentially with the whole Blackout Tuesday thing and everyone telling everyone to follow us. So I would say the follower count thing and tokenism, definitely I would like to see those things stop immediately because they prevent a variety of Black voices from being heard. And one Black uh, influencer is not going to tell the story of Destination the same way another is. And one Black influencer, most their audience isn't necessarily all Black and they're not going to necessarily tell it that way, but it's just we have our own voice because of our experiences as Black people. So I would just like to see the follower count thing like not be the sole reason why you choose to work with someone or not. Because it's not, it doesn't even always reflect how influential someone is. I mean, I had like 20K when I self-published a guidebook and it sold like 700 copies and no one would ever even know that. And I got denied a lot of opportunities because, oh, you only have 20K followers. We're looking for 100K and up. Sorry. It's like, okay, but you didn't look at my work. You didn't look at my writing skill. You didn't ask for a media kit to break down my audience. You just automatically said no because I don't have this number, which can be easily achieved in other ways, which I don't even want to go into that, but yeah. I no, just want let's, to let's, let's go into that because let's call a spade a spade. Um, most of the white influencers, their numbers are bought and we all know that. Um, but brands only want to work with um, influencers that have 100,000 followers when 99,000 of those followers are bought and their their likes are bought. So, you know, you're working with someone that, you know, is not going to bring you an ROI and you're paying them top dollar and not questioning anything. But if a black content creator comes to you, you're checking every I, dotting every T, you're making sure that everything is perfect when a lot, the majority of these influencers, their, their numbers are bought. And that's just, that's factual. So it seems like the conversation in needs and the redefining what success looks like that we need to, um, crowd professionals like myself need to gravitate away from looking at the numbers, but the next steps would be actually not letting that be the, the defining thing, but looking at the engagement, looking at the content, um, looking and, and because it is hard to justify uh, and, and just because a number um, when you can achieve it in a variety of different ways um, and so it seems like for those of you listening that you know it's time that we redefine that and not let the number be the thing that you go after you know I, I use that same thing for influencers but same thing as well for publications you know I always like to say if you if you're looking to include black people I would say a lot of my black friends who travel that, that this is in my small community are not looking at travel and leisure. So if that is your goal to reach me, then you're not gonna reach me. Now, if you're going to do, uh, if, if you're gonna post something on any one of these influencers page, I can guarantee you my friends follow them. I can guarantee you that there's a chance that it's going to eventually make it across my feed. If you are, you, if you're publishing something in um, Essence or Travel Noir or any of those publications, you know, you can guarantee that, okay, it's going to co come across my feed. And then there's a unconventional um, outlets like Roots, uh, like the root.com. Uh, that always like it's always on my feed no matter what it's a it's a trusted source of information and and so you know even those unconventional non-travel spaces you have that black people are uh, you can if you look out for those outlets um, those are great spaces where we are getting content and looking for information uh, and so um, I'm gonna go into I'm gonna open this up to questions um, so Taryn do we have anyone that has any questions from the audience we do. And I'll take a, just a minute to encourage anyone who's attending to submit a question through the little Q&A icon down at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get through as many as we can. Uh, the first one is from Susan. Um, some African-American writers I've worked with in the past uh, were offended that I targeted them for some of the Black stories. They didn't want to get the Black stories, but not the other stories. So sometimes I've been more likely to pitch a story with black roots to someone who is white and writing about these things. Has this shifted some with today's new awareness on the part of editors? Some black colleagues have, 
have been offended that I would ask them to go to a plantation. I've always asked before putting it on and that on an itinerary, should I continue to ask? Okay, so um, <laughs> that question has a lot of issues there. First of all, how were you framing these stories? It sounds as if you were trying to treat these Black writers as tokens. Here's a Black area, you must want to tell this story. Um, and yeah, that's, that, that can be insulting, um, especially if you didn't do the research and, and, and see the kinds of stories that these writers write. Perhaps you targeted them and they specialize in food. So they're not gonna be interested in telling the story. Perhaps you should have said, well, you know, here's a black chef that can also be a part of the story. I'm not sure, but the fact that they turned you down to me says that there was probably something you were missing that was perhaps culturally insensitive. Just, just the impression that I get. In terms of plantations, that's a really delicate subject. Um, I have written on plantations, but I'll tell you, I have written on plantations specifically from an African-American perspective. A lot of plantations do not tell our stories. If you are representing plantations that are whitewashing history and talking about how this beautiful uh, location was just built by some happy people, and now it's this historic landmark, that's going to be problematic. Um, this nation was built by African Americans, and you have to address that in order to appeal to Black writers to want to tell those stories. And even then, some of us are just not going to want to tell those stories. They're very difficult stories to tell. Yeah. And I'm going to add in one little point to that. It sounds to me that uh, one thing that one of the one of our speakers here said earlier, uh, making assumptions. You can't make an assumption that a black writer wants to cover black content. Uh, you have to again treat them as anyone else. Um, but the value that you get in getting a black writer is because the tone in which they speak, or the information that that they convey, or the avenue where their information is going or the outlet um, may be a place that is appealing to black people and they're speaking from their perspective which will eventually attract a black audience that may not have anything to do with that plantation that you were trying to pitch so don't make the assumptions include the black writer and and, and gravitate what they what they want to pitch um so uh in terence more questions yep uh so allison keeney asks what are the top black publications and outlets we should be pitching or following? Well, actually, go ahead. Well, go ahead. I was gonna say, before we answer this question, this is why I hate this question. <laughs> because I wanna tell you, but I also want you to do your own research. Google, everybody knows how to use Google. Everybody knows how to use social media. We, as in these people on this call and some of our other colleagues have constantly put out these articles about the black travel movement you can follow about the black travelers or influencers that you can follow ever since george floyd you have seen nothing but black narratives in every single tra travel publication set an alert on google for black travel so every time something comes up it comes to your inbox go through there and research it but do your research one of the things that the black travel alliance does want to do is create a directory but we will be charging you because now you're taking my network and you're taking my knowledge and you're using it for your good when i've done all i could do to create this or when i've done all i can do to have this knowledge so thank you for asking the question but I want you to do your own research and not to be rude, not to be any of that. It's just as, as easy as somebody typing in places for the LGBTQIA plus community to go that is friendly for them during June, you can type in black travel influencers that we should be following. You can type in black travel movements that we should be following. That will all come up on Google. So, and then the thing about it is once you follow one on Instagram because of the algorithm, if you follow No Madness, which I run, once you follow No Madness, guess who else is going to come up? Travel Noir. Guess who else is going to come up? Black Travel Gram. Guess who else is going to come up? Black Voyagers. Guess who else is going to come up? Black Travel Journey. And I just gave you six right there off the top of my head. So it's, it's you doing the work. 
It's you immersing yourself into this community and it's not hard to find. We cannot stand when people say we can't find it. How? Google. It's there in Google. So I'm going to say I do it all the time when I'm intentionally searching for black writers. I intentionally, I use some of the hashtags that, we, that I have listed here. Um, I go on Instagram, the Twitter, and these hashtags will lead you to hundreds and hundreds of black people who are in the travel oh. space. Uh, and, and it will be people that you will want to work with and people that you will want to invite to your destination. Uh, I just picked... These are not like the only three sites. There are tons of them. I just picked three immediately that I just want to throw on the screen so that you can start your search on your own from this point, um, which obviously learn about everything at the blacktravelalliance.com. Travel No Madness, Travel Tribe is actually, um, they're also one of the creators of Audacity Fest and Memphis was lucky to host them uh, in 2019. Um, start there and look up all the individuals that are a part of that. And then my potential personal favorite site that I love to go to is Travel Noir. Uh, so I definitely say, uh, you know, look them up as well. Um, but if you use those hashtags that are listed here, um, they'll take you in the right space. So if you Google and use the hashtags, um, they'll take you in the right space and you just, it, you'll start going down the wormhole of no return, just like you do when you, you're on your phone on Facebook and you just, before you know it, you found everything that you need. And, uh, you know, glad you asked the question. Um, just a matter of just being intentional and taking some time to search and look for it. Um, Taryn, any more questions? Yeah, we've got a bunch. Uh, so Marissa asks, I ask a lot of questions to customize an itinerary and I'd like to ask better questions. What questions do you want destinations to ask you ahead of a trip? What are some things you'd wished a destination had asked? Uh, Lauren, maybe we toss that one to you? Uh, sure, I mean, it's, it's honestly not rocket science. It is a simple conversation of, number one, I would expect that you've already done some kind of research on me and what I've written and the content that I've shared, right? So if you go to just my top nine right now on my Instagram, I would expect one of your questions to be, you know, we have this great kayaking outfitter. Is that something you like to do while you're here? Why? Because I have three posts that show me actively paddling, right, in a kayak. You know, if you go to my blog, I would expect you to ask me something like, oh, would you like to do, you know, what kind of, what kind of accommodations do you want to stay in for this trip? I know you're outdoorsy, but do you want to do a hotel? You want to do glamping? I would expect you to tailor it towards me because we're not a monolith so the way i travel is not how francesca travels it's not how tamiko travels it's not how marty travels and not how you know rosalind we are all different we all have our niches and our interests so tailor it towards my niche and it's not it's not hard to figure out what that is and if you're really unsure we really can just jump on a call and, and i've had destinations ask me Here's, here's all of the 150 things and outfitters and businesses we work with. Do any of these interest you? Let me know. And if there's something that you like to do and you don't see it, by all means, let me know. Gulf Shores, Alabama was great for doing that. They, they gave me freedom to build an itinerary that my audience was going to respond to and expect from me. Okay. All right. Taryn, any Thanks, more Thanks, Lauren. Uh, Althea, and I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name cor correctly, if not, my apologies, asks, hi, I work for an agency that works with destinations, hotels, and restaurants. What advice does the panel have on educating the agency, my colleagues, and the clients of the importance, on the importance of inclusivity and what we've discussed today so that we can actively recommend and incorporate into our strategies? I, I, I can take that one just to... I think one of the things that they should do is not look at this as, you know, oh, I've got to sell the black, you know, travel writer or, or to, in order to bring them in, you know, it's, it's, it's black experiences matter. Just like everybody else has an experience. We're just like everybody else. Black lives matter. Black experiences matter. You know, it's, it's just telling them, Hey, we have, you know, a, a person who writes for, you know, travel noir and, they want to come in. You shouldn't have to ex explain it off the top, but they're black. Um, so are you going to be okay with that? No, don't sell it that way. Don't pitch it that way. This is a person who happens to be African American that's coming into our city and we want to talk to you about what you can offer them as an attraction. You know, just make it, make it more that way versus looking at it like, oh my goodness, they may say no. When you pitch it the other way, hey, 
it's just a person coming in just like every other travel writer. And also, uh, and I don't even know if this has been uh, been discussed in, or, or whether or not it should even be looked like that. It's up for debate. But the amount of money and revenue that destinations lose out on by not using their trade fund dollars to market to Black people is astonishing, especially Black women. We travel in packs and we do luxury. Like, you, we should be on your radar. We especially for me, <laughs> I am not Lauren. I've traveled with Lauren before. She does outdoor. I want to be sitting at a luxury five-star resort, drinking me a cocktail with somebody waiting on me. We come in all, we all have different ways we like to travel. Why aren't you utilizing that? It's just, it doesn't, I don't understand why. And, and brands don't show black luxury. They, that's something that they shy away from. Why don't you show black luxury? We have just as much money as everybody else do. So I think that's part when brands don't, aren't educated on the amount of money that we spend. They don't know, they don't think about it. It's just not a part of their thought process. Great. Uh, we're gonna do one more question. Sure. Uh, someone asked, are there examples of brand messaging that may be offensive or not inclusive? is using soul of a destination offensive when discussing the African-American community. So, you know, you know, I was gonna say, so, you know, Memphis is a destination that uh, we are the home to blues, uh, soul music and rock and roll. And so um, we use the word soul a lot. It resonates with our destination and with our tourists, um, but we're very careful and making sure because you know there there, there was an African American male who told me himself because um, it melts when I think of soul it, to me it says like it's you me giving you my all me giving you my arm my soul my existence is and which leads back to you owning me kind of a conversation and so that's where his thoughts went when he heard the word soul uh, and so we we continue to use it but we make sure that we use it appropriately as we as we tied it into the music in Memphis and tied it into um, uh, the music and all the other things that, that, that we attach to it from um, like our, our Rock and Soul Museum to the Stack Museum of American Soul Music. And so it just makes sure that it's talked about appropriately and that we're just not out here just randomly using the word soul in a place that it doesn't fit. Uh, and so you, you, you do have to be careful with certain words. And, you know, and I would say, you know, if, if, it, if you are, I always say, if you are unsure, you should not use it. One way to get past it is hiring somebody internally because we know if your team internally does not look diverse, what you put out externally is not going to look diverse. You might not have enough money to have somebody on full time, but that's why there are people who are consultants who do this work. There are two examples that come to mind. Um, the first is, I think it was, it was one of the, I think it was Ancestry.com where they put out this video and there's a black woman talking, but her wig was horrific. And in my head, I'm thinking, who's, who told her to wear this wig that was so terrible that I'm not even now focused on what she's saying? I'm like, her wig looks horrific. But they were trying to show ethnic hair. And wow. I'm like, it's such a disconnect here because now I'm like, Ancestry.com, I can't even take you seriously because somebody did not think this through. The other example I have, and I will not name the name of this one, but three days before February of this year, a brand reached out to multiple African-American um, influencers to do a Black History Month campaign. This is one of the leading travel brands in America. And on January 28th, they're in my inbox. Can we talk about what we're going to do about Black History Month? Excuse me? January 28th, three days away. And then you want to rush me and getting on the phone with you to talk about what you can do as the major brand Francesca knows because she was she was reached out to and 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 it just was so frustrating because in June LGBTQ month you have that set up in December so yeah, you yeah. thought about that six months in advance 
But now we are, we are the last minute, oh, we got to make sure that we do this. And not only that, this brand employs the majority of African-American people in this travel space for what they do. So I'm like, how much of a disconnect is this going to be? And it's a double-edged sword because some people are like, ah, if I don't do this, I won't have this relationship with this brand and I need to have that. And then other people are like, how dare you? How at me next year? in December or in October for Black History Month. It cannot be the last minute thought. When diversity and inclusion are at top of mind, all of your stuff will flow smoothly. And, and tool brands realize that diversity and inclusion is the growth. It's the growth of your business. It, will, it is what will make your business grow. You will continue to have a disconnect. So please do not wait to the last minute to amplify a black story or to amplify a black voice, be serious about it from the start and you will have better success. Okay, so this is all the time that we have for today, everybody. Thank you to all of our speakers and panelists for joining in and sharing your thoughts. Everyone um, that is in the audience, please keep in mind, this is just the start. You must continue this conversation within your organization and your peers and colleagues in the industry to make sure that you are being inclusive and being intentional. And you have to get to a place also that it is not just intentional, um, but where it is a part of your DNA and your existence that you do it without thinking. Um, so with that said, key takeaways that you guys can keep in mind some things to recap that what we've discussed today. Go home, well, or some of your work, go back to your place of employment and look at your social media, look at your website, look at your media list and take a survey and what does that look like? Um, when it comes to um, redefining success in the goals uh, of, in, of, in the PR results, Go back and, and, and make sure that you give the same value that you give the travel leisure that you give to these black influencers and these black publications. So go back and redefine the matrix of what success and the measurements of what success means for your PR goals. Um, go back and make sure that you are being inclusive on your itineraries uh, and the stories that you're pitching and the stories that you create. Um, that is some of the the things that we talked about today and those are some things that I hope you can grab a hold to and take the torch and do those things immediately. Um, but again, thank you all for our speakers and those who tuned in to become educated on the subject. Um, also, PRSA will be having a uh, diversity and inclusion webinar that will take place in a week and a half. So keep be on the lookout for the information. We also will be having some of our influencers that are part of the Black Travel Alliance. They will be taking over our Instagram um, uh, in, a, in coming weeks. Uh, and so that way you can instantly make sure you're following uh, at, PR, at PRSA Travel um, so that you can see the influences there that you might want to work with. So keep, keep a watch on our Instagram page. Um, and, and that is it. And I'm going to show you guys that if you're looking to contact any of the speakers from today, here is the website of our travel writers and travel influencers. Thank you all for attending. I am Milton Howery, the Director of Publications or Public Relations for Memphis Tourism, and I'm on the PRSA Travel and Tourism Board. And thank you to my co-host today, Taryn, for helping me monitor things, as well as my other co-host, Tamiko Harvey, um, with Passports um, and Grubs, helping us facilitate this conversation and bring this together. And a big thank you to the Black Travel Alliance for holding the industry accountable and starting this important subject um, that we should have had years ago, but that we had today. You guys have a good, happy Tuesday and a good afternoon, and we'll see you at our next webinar. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.